The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a welcoming congregation. This means our community is open to all without regard to race, gender, sexual orientation, age, or income. You are welcome here. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton gathers with gratitude on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. And I now invite Gloria Cranebreck to give the congregational call for our annual general meeting, which is happening next Sunday. That's right. According to our bylaws, I am, uh, my responsibility is to announce this general meeting in the services. And so that is annual general meeting for UCE will take place next Sunday morning. The start time of the meeting is 1145. It's going to be a Zoom meeting, and you can uh, enter that Zoom meeting from 11.30 onward. Um, you, should, you need to pre-register for that meeting. And the information for the pre-registration is on the second page of the newsletter. There's a link there, and you will receive an email stating that you are registered. And there's a link in that email for especially for you, only for you, to join that meeting. And I would suggest that you get busy and do that pre-registration as soon as possible so that you know that you're registered. And if you have any problems, you can contact uh, some of our people and get that straightened out. Um, the AGM materials will, will be on the UCE website. And the newsletter explains how to get to those. If you, if you, don't, if you want a paper copy or you need a paper copy, Phone Janet at the church office number and she will mail that out to you. And I think that's about it. So it's next Sunday, folks. And I will just add that if you did not receive the email with the newsletter, you can go to uce.ca, the website, and download the newsletter to yourself. <clears throat> We'll now start our service with the prelude. And the music is Gathering the Morning Dew, and it was re recorded and composed by Gordon Ritchie. <laughs>
We'll light the chalice, spark of the original fire of creation, to remind us that we are all on this planet. The furred, the feathered, the thinned, the scaled, along with us featherless bipeds. We're all made of the same star stuff and share common destiny. We share the same hopes of a life free from harm and suffering and the same aspirations of happiness, love and flourishing. We are the many diverse perspectives from which the whole is seen and experienced. We are inextricably connected and interdependent and it is good. We'll now talk about sharing our abundance and being good stewards to our planet and to our church. And I'm wondering if we can get the sharing abundance slide set up. There we are. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on your donations to support staff programs. During this unprecedented time, we need our financial support more than ever to maintain the connections with members and friends. Many of our members contribute on a monthly basis with regular electronic funds transfers or debits from our checking accounts or with pre or post-dated checks. Others who often put their music or music money into the collection plate each Sunday can, as an alternate, go to the Canada Helps website. You can either get to it from the UCA website or just Google Canada Helps. It will take you to the site, which is a secure site where you can donate. And for the month of April, our abundance partner has been the Unitarian Universalist United Nations Office, UUUNO, and the information is in the April newsletter of how to donate to that organization. As you can see on the slide that is up, in the month of May, the Youth Empowerment and Support Services, yes, will be our sharing abundance partner. I'm going to try and play the sound, but I'm not sure it's going to work. No, I'm sorry, Seth, I can't do that. You mean uh, from you I receive? Yes. I think I have it here. So we'll all mute, including me. You don't want to hear me singing. And sing along with the um, chorus of from you I give, from you I receive to you I give. A reading now written by Hope Jaren. It's an excerpt from a larger work that she had written. A seed knows how to wait. A seed knows how to wait. Most seeds wait for several years before starting to grow. A cherry seed can wait for a hundred years with no problem. What exactly each seed is waiting for is known only to that seed. Some unique trigger combination of temperature, moisture, light, and many other things is required to convince a seed to jump off the deep end and take its chance, to take its one and only chance to grow. A seed is alive while it waits. Every acorn on the ground is just as alive as the 300-year-old oak tree that towers over it. Neither the seed nor the old oak is growing. They're both just waiting. Their waiting differs, however, in that the seed is waiting to flourish, while the tree is only waiting to die. When you go into a forest, you probably tend to look up at the plants that have grown so much taller than you ever could. 
you probably don't look down where just beneath your single footprint sits between 100 and 1,000 seeds, each one alive and waiting. When you are in the forest, for every tree that you see, there are no less than three million more trees waiting in the soil, fervently wishing to be. When the embryo within a seed starts to grow, it basically just stretches out of its doubled over waiting posture, elongating into official ownership of the form that it assumed years ago. The hard coat that surrounds a peach pit, a sesame or mustard seed, or a walnut shell mostly exists to prevent this expansion. In the laboratory, we simply scratch the hard coat and add a little water, and it's enough to make almost any seed grow. I must have cracked thousands of seeds over the years, and yet the next day's green never fails to amaze me. Something so hard can be so easy if you just have a little help in the right place, under the right conditions, you can finally stretch out into what you're supposed to be. Each beginning is the end of a waiting. We are each given exactly one chance to be. Each of us is both impossible and inevitable. And every replete tree was first a seed that waited. And this is an excerpt from Lab Girl by Hope Jaron. I retrieved it from the uh, Unitarian Universalist Association worship web. And I thought of it because the whole point of pollination and what pollinators do ends up being the seed that grows, that turns into food for us or that turns into beauty. But for now, we'll take time for candles of care and connection. And while the music plays, the, you can use the chat feature to recognize what you have been waiting for. But first, I would like to light a virtual, actually 22 virtual candles for the 22 lives that were taken in Nova Scotia last weekend. And now we'll have a musical interlude while our candles are lit.
Well, today is the first Sunday after Earth Day. Earth Day fell right in the middle of the week this year on Wednesday. April 22nd, 2020 marked 50 years of Earth Day. The first Earth Day in 1970 was a unified response to an environment in crisis. Oil spills, smog, rivers so polluted they literally caught fire. The first Earth Day is credited with launching the modern environmental movement and is now recognized as the planet's largest civic event. There's much that citizens can do to help protect and restore our planet, from joining a cleanup to taking part in the world's largest citizen science initiative, to hosting an event in one's own community. In the interests of developing citizen science capacity and understanding the interconnectedness of pollinators with the health of native plant populations and the beauty of the natural world, we now invite Mike Jenkins, City of Edmonton bug guy, to tell us about the importance of pollinators. Hello. Um, so yeah, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, so yeah, uh, do, do, do. I will share my screen here. We can hear you, Mike. And oh, uh, I'll just uh, minimize this and pull my presentation up. Hopefully the cat doesn't come and sit on the uh, keyboard. So he's done a couple of times already. So yeah, um, so my name is Mike Jenkins. I'm the coordinator of pest management for the city of Edmonton, uh, but I'm probably better known as just the bug guy. Um, so we mostly are known for our mosquito control program, but we also do a lot of stuff uh, promoting uh, backyard beneficial insects uh, and uh, generally trying to encourage uh, uh, the benefits of our urban ecosystem to uh, the citizens of the city of Edmonton. And part of that is our pollinators. Um, so pollinators are very, very important to the ecosystem. Um, most people are familiar, of course, with uh, honeybees, but there are a lot of other pollinators around as well. Um, pollinators are uh, basically animals, usually, uh, that uh, visit flowers, pick up pollen, and move them from one plant to another. Uh, and the flowering plants uh, that evolved during the Cretaceous uh, have largely co-evolved with a lot of different uh, other organisms in order to move those pollen from one plant to another. And uh, most of the, the large colorful flowers that we see uh, and value as uh, um, sort of decorative uh, 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 things to add to our yard and things, uh, they actually evolved specifically to attract uh, usually insects, but also other organisms, uh, specifically to draw them in, uh, give them uh, some nectar as a, essentially a bribe, uh, and then hopefully move the pollen on elsewhere. Um, so there's been a lot of co-evolution over the last uh, 70 million years or so uh, between uh, insects and flowers in particular, uh, developing this entire system uh, until now probably about 80% of all flowering plants depend on uh, an insect for pollination uh, in one way or another. Uh, there are some plants that are wind pollinated and there's uh, a few other methods as well, but most of them are insect pollinated. Uh, and so uh, insects are very important to the ecosystem and a lot of the insects uh, rely on the pollen as well. Um, so there's uh, uh, lots of different things that are uh, uh, happening with that ecosystem. Uh, and because of the importance of those pollinators for the flowering plants, they're also very important to us. So a lot of the things that the plants produce uh, that are important to our, us in terms of agriculture also depend on these pollinators. Uh, it's estimated that uh, about one out of every three uh, spoonfuls or forkfuls of food that we consume uh, off of our plates uh, event uh, was the result of the work of a pollinator. Um, so most of our fruits, many of our vegetables, um, even uh, some of the things that we don't necessarily think of, uh, a lot of the fo uh, forage food that uh, a lot of our livestock species feed on uh, is actually pollinated 
by insects. Uh, so without the insects, we wouldn't have that forage food and our livestock wouldn't be as uh, uh, vital either. So um, lots of different things depend on them. Uh, but bees are not the only pollinators. There are a lot of other species that do pollination. Beetles are actually really, really important in a lot of ecosystems for doing pollination. Um, they're not as important uh, in northern climates, um, uh, but really vital in a lot of equatorial regions. And there are a lot of crops that depend specifically on beetles. Uh, macadamia nuts are one uh, in particular that relies on beetles. Uh, so without those beetle pollinators, we wouldn't have those. Um, there are also a large number of plants that uh, depend on moths and butterflies. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different uh, butterfly and moth pollinated species around here. A lot of our native plants uh, depend on these and they are also uh, largely important in uh, alpine ecosystems. Uh, this is uh, a type of moth often called a hummingbird moth. Um, it's actually in the, uh, sometimes also called a sphinx moth. Um, but they're very, very large, often actually mistaken for hummingbirds, uh, which are another uh, potential pollinator. Um, but yeah, also very, very important uh, as pollinators. Uh, and flies. So flies are extremely important, especially the farther north you go and the, the fewer uh, butterflies and bees that you get, uh, flies are actually more and more important uh, and in alpine ecosystems as well. Um, so they're visiting flowers, picking up nectar, and then they pick up the pollen and move it uh, uh, from one plant to another. Uh, but they're also important in a lot of other ecosystems. Uh, there's one, uh, it's actually a biting midge, uh, Cerat Ceratopagonid or Noceum, uh, that's actually vital for the pollination of cacao beans. Uh, so without uh, this biting midge, uh, we wouldn't have cocoa uh, and chocolate. So another really vital pollinator. Uh, and we have mammals even. Um, this is probably one of the cutest pollinators around. This is the honey possum from Australia. Um, so unfortunately we don't have anything quite that cute uh, that's a <laughs> pollinator in Alberta, but uh, we do have uh, other cute mammal pollinators. Bats are another important pollinator. Um, not so much in Alberta, um, but we do have uh, uh, pollinator bats um, in North America. Uh, and uh, they're especially important in tropical and equatorial regions. Uh, the agave uh, that produces uh, both natural sweeteners and of course is used in tequila uh, requires bats for pollination. Uh, so this bat is uh, obviously very, very happy that he's absolutely covered in pollen. Um, but uh, there are a number of plants that uh, require bats for pollination uh, and a number of uh, plants that actually just flower at night specifically to draw in bats. Uh, but probably the most common uh, and uh, most familiar uh, pollinator to most people is the European honeybee. And it's what most people think of when they think of uh, a pollinator. Uh, they're the one that um, when people are uh, thinking about promoting pollination, uh, people think, oh, we have to set up a honeybee hive and they'll set up the, the hive and uh, start uh, uh, hoping that that will uh, improve their pollination services, which is true. Um, they are widely used in agriculture um, for uh, their services in uh, pollination. Um, but uh, the European honeybee is just one species of bee. Um, and there are thousands of species of bee worldwide. We have about 300 or so in Alberta. Um, and the European species of honeybee is of course a European import. Uh, they prefer European species of plants, um, which includes many of the species that we actually consider weeds. So they prefer things like uh, uh, Canada thistle and uh, um, uh, not so much dandelions, uh, they actually don't like dandelions all that much. Uh, but yeah, a lot of those European weed species are ones that uh, the honeybees prefer. Uh, but uh, bees are social insects uh, in general. Um, and honeybees in particular are sort of the uh, prototypical social insect. Uh, but what really differentiates the bees from say wasps and other uh, insects is bees uh, require pollen. Pollen is their primary um, protein source. Uh, 
And so they're going to flower specifically to gather pollen and they're uh, taking that pollen, carrying it back to their young and using that to feed to their young uh, as protein uh, to graze their, their brood on. Uh, and then the honeybees, they actually carry that pollen on little sacks on their, their legs. And uh, because of that, uh, bees are actually not as efficient uh, as pollinators as a lot of other species are. Uh, like the, the bat and the fly that we saw earlier, are absolutely covered in pollen, but they're not keeping that pollen for themselves. Uh, so they're not really, they don't care if uh, all of it gets spread to the next uh, flower. Uh, whereas the, the bees take a fairly high tax in terms of the pollen. So plants that are pollinated by bees need to produce a lot more pollen uh, because uh, the bees are taking more of it as uh, sort of their share. Um, but because there are so many of the bees and they're only visiting flowers and they're visiting flowers all day long, um, just by sheer volume, they end up uh, being uh, efficient pollinators that way. Um, so it, it's kind of, uh, uh, different strategies for different plants as to uh, which ones they want to try to attract. Uh, they can either um, try to attract different sorts of uh, insects and uh, put less into pollen production or just go for the bees and uh, uh, go for that. So the honeybees of course are famous for producing honey. Um, they're pretty much uh, uh, the only ones in uh, this region that will actually produce the honey. Uh, they build the uh, wax cells and then they fill that with honey and they use that uh, also for provisioning their young and for feeding themselves. Uh, it's basically, uh, they've taken the nectar from the, the flowers and uh, removed all the moisture. Uh, and then it's uh, in a form that can be stored literally for thousands of years, um, uh, packed into those cells and uh, uh, remains free of bacteria. Uh, mold, all those sorts of things, and can be used as a food source uh, ongoing. Um, so most of the other bee species don't produce honey, so they're not as useful in that sense. Uh, but the other pollinators are still very, very useful in as pollinators. Um, so we'll look at uh, some of these other ones. Uh, bumblebees are, of course, when most people are familiar with bumblebees, uh, most of them are quite large, very, very furry, uh, and we have probably about a dozen or so species in Alberta. Uh, most of them are ground nesting. These ones are social bees as well, but they don't produce honey. Um, they have a queen, uh, they have workers. Uh, they do most of the stuff that uh, a honeybee will do. Uh, they're going out and they're collecting pollen, bringing it back to the nest, and they'll uh, pollinate uh, different uh, plants in that. Um, but uh, the nests don't get anywhere near as large as for the honeybees. Uh, they'll maybe have about a dozen or so workers by the end of the season. Uh, and then at the end of the season, uh, the queen will actually produce several uh, new queens who go out in overwinter, uh, and then they'll produce a, a new hive the next spring. Uh, and the hive doesn't continue on year after year the way uh, honeybee hives uh, potentially can. Um, but uh, yeah, a whole bunch of different native species and of course prefer our native plants over the uh, European ones. Uh, but we have a bunch of different uh, species that are solitary bees. So uh, these are bees that don't live in colonies. They don't have a queen and they don't produce workers. Uh, it's just one female and she'll have uh, one nest for herself and she'll lay uh, one set of uh, eggs, produce larvae, and then she'll provision those larvae with a certain amount of um, uh, food, uh, pollen, uh, often modified in some way into sort of a bread uh, and other things and then uh, continue on from there. And many of them build tunnels. So there's a bunch of different species of them that uh, will build a tunnel of some sort uh, and then lay eggs in the tunnel, each one kind of turned into a cell uh, that then uh, they lay an egg in and then the larva develops inside that cell and then they emerge in order uh, out of that tunnel. And it's uh, fairly interesting because the first egg laid is, of course, the one farthest down the tunnel. Um, and then the last leg egg, is, egg laid is the last one uh, in the tunnel. Uh, but that's the first one to develop and emerge. Uh, so it's the fastest developing 
larva, uh, whereas the one at the bottom is the slowest developing larva. Uh, and the whole thing is timed very, very carefully so that each one uh, develops in the right order and emerges one after the other so that they don't end up with uh, uh, one uh, waiting basically for all of the other ones to emerge. Uh, they, they come out in the right order. So it's an amazing uh, uh, ability. Um, no one's really sure exactly how they set up that uh, chronological system or know how many they're going to be laying to uh, set the clock on each one. Um, but there's a number of these. Uh, one of our most common is called the carpenter bee. Uh, these ones will chew through wood. Uh, they build their tunnels in wood. Uh, so that was uh, a tunnel of the carpenter bee that we saw uh, in that picture. Um, and they can do some damage to structures uh, uh, in doing so. Um, but they will use existing tunnels if they're available. So in order to avoid the structural damage, if you can give them a tunnel, uh, then they'll use that, uh, and that can be beneficial as well. Um, and uh, they look basically like uh, uh, your standard honeybee or bumblebee, uh, but instead of the black and white stripes, they typically have a, just a uh, non-furry black abdomen. Um, they do have stingers, uh, and they can sting, uh, but because it's just one female, um, they uh, are not as aggressive or uh, defensive as uh, say honeybees are. Uh, they can't afford to lose their life defending their nest uh, the way that uh, worker bees can. Uh, so they uh, are not nearly as prone to uh, stinging as uh, honeybees or uh, especially yellow jackets or something are. Um, so uh, much less uh, uh, danger of uh, being stung uh, than you are even uh, with honeybees. Uh, and then uh, once they're done laying all their eggs, they actually cap the tunnel with some chewed wood or pulp. And so that's how you can tell uh, at the end uh, sort of uh, what sort of bee might have uh, actually used the tunnel is by the cap that they leave on the end. Uh, we also have leaf cutter bees. So these are uh, somewhat smaller than the carpenter bees. Um, they aren't able to chew through wood, uh, but they will use existing holes. Uh, they can chew into soft plants. So they'll sometimes go into shrubs, uh, even rose bushes, uh, things like that. Um, they also have stingers, but they're even more docile than the carpenter bees. Um, you'd basically probably have to injure one to get it to sting. Uh, and then the sting is uh, much less uh, uh, potent or painful than uh, most other uh, uh, bee or wasp things. Uh, unlike uh, the honeybees or the bumblebees, they don't have uh, specialized structures on their legs for carrying the pollen. They actually carry pollen on hairs on the underside of their abdomen. Um, and then they cap their tunnel with leaves. Uh, and so that's what this one is doing is actually cutting a nice round circular hole out of the, the leaf. And sometimes you can find these uh, cut uh, circles on the leaves uh, where the leaf cutters have been. Uh, and they kind of make a, a sort of a rolled cigar uh, for each of the, the cells uh, that they've uh, laid their, their eggs in. Closer related to the leaf cutter bee is mason bees. Uh, they build their tunnels out of mud and dirt, um, but if you leave them a tunnel, again, they will use that instead. Uh, much like the uh, uh, leaf cutter bee, they're also quite docile. And this one you can actually see on his abdomen. Uh, she's carrying a bunch of pollen on there. Uh, and they cap their tunnel with mud, um, since that's usually what they end up uh, building their nest out of. Um, uh, they vary a lot in different colors, uh, but many species of them are have a metallic blue or green sheen to them. Um, and then uh, kind of uh, variable in the amount of fur that they have. And then there's the masked, masked bee. Uh, this one is often mistaken for a wasp. Uh, they don't really have much in the way of fur and they often have uh, bright yellow or orange markings on them. Um, they're very, very small, um, often less than three millimeters long. Uh, and th so they need uh, quite small tunnels um, and they don't carry the pollen on the outside of their body. Uh, the female actually swallows it and they carry it in a crop and they bring it back to their young that way. 
and they cap the tunnel with a little translucent wax. It's uh, actually uh, uh, looks very similar to cellophane. Um, so you go through. So uh, a good way to promote uh, all of those pollinators, uh, these tunnel nesting ones, is with uh, what's called a pollinator hotel. Uh, you can buy these in many garden stores. You can make your own. Um, but it's basically a collection of a whole bunch of uh, different pieces of wood or dowels or other things uh, with uh, small tunnels in them, uh, little holes that they can use uh, rather than having to dig their own uh, and um, uh, uh, fill those with their young. And uh, uh, they're able to utilize those as nesting sites uh, and um, uh, continue on their their uh, reproductive services uh, and going out and pollinating. Um, so uh, there's a whole bunch of different types of these things available. You can get them in small, medium, large, deluxe things. You can build your own. Um, uh, if you want to build your own, you can just take a block of wood and drill variable different size holes in them. Um, this is probably uh, uh, better than getting a lot of the commercially available ones. Uh, the commercially available ones, uh, often uh, many of the largest holes are sized more for species we don't really get here. Um, so the, the biggest ones aren't really of any use to any of uh, the species we get here. Uh, and then um, you can drill different sizes uh, that we would get around here, uh, different depths as well. Um, and of course, uh, doing this is uh, pretty cheap. Um, also, many of the commercial ones, uh, especially the smaller holes, they often use bamboo. And the bamboo tubes uh, are not uh, very water permeable, and they tend to gather moisture inside it, and it uh, will get fungus uh, and other um, uh, things happening inside there. And uh, often, uh, the, the larvae don't successfully emerge from those bamboo tubes. Um, it, it just is not a good uh, substance for them to be using. Um, you can also make uh, more decorative ones. Here's one that's actually done in uh, uh, old stump uh, that somebody's drilled holes into. And so you can uh, do this, uh, put it in a corner of your yard. Uh, this is taken from the Edmonton Area Land Trust website. And they actually have a fantastic website that has lots of tips on uh, uh, native pollinators and how to build uh, pollinators and uh, tips on uh, how to uh, keep and uh, do maintenance on your pollinator blocks, uh, your pollinator hotels. Uh, this particular one, uh, these holes look a little large and they're all a little uniform in size. I would go for a lot more different sized ones uh, and uh, uh, probably uh, more uh, coverage around the, uh, the whole uh, uh, stump itself, but uh, this is pretty good too. Uh, and you can go super cheap too. So here's one uh, little block of wood and a bunch of straws in a one liter milk carton. Uh, put that out in your garden and that can act as a, a pretty good pollinator block as well. Again, you would want to use paper straws and not plastic, uh, both because the plastic straws can be a hazard later when you go to uh, uh, dispose of it, but the plastic straws will also, uh, they're not water permeable and uh, you're going to have uh, issues with moisture and uh, fungus buildup inside there. Um, so once you have the, the pollinator block, there's a, a lot of question about uh, what to do afterwards. A lot of the advice guides will say to clean them out uh, every year, use pipe cleaners, all those sorts of things to clean out the inside of the uh, the tunnels. Uh, otherwise, you'll get uh, buildup of things like mites and parasitic wasps. Um, so that depends a lot on if you want to have just the bees or if you're also looking to help promote other native species uh, because a lot of those things like those parasitic wasps are actually native species as well. They are also really good pollinators and they're also uh, largely beneficial in going after a lot of other um, pests uh, and they may not be necessarily going after the bees themselves. Uh, they also need those same sort of habitats just to overwinter in. Um, 
So cleaning up the parasitic wasps out of your pollinator blocks is not necessarily a good thing. That can actually be a really beneficial uh, uh, habitat for the parasitic wasps to uh, stay in. And here's a parasitic wasp that's actually going after aphids. Um, so they're a really good uh, beneficial um, insect to have in your garden just on their own. Uh, besides their uh, 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 pollinator um, abilities. So uh, whether you clean them out or not depends a lot on whether you just want bees or if you're looking to promote all uh, native species. Um, then there's other things like uh, the digger bees. Uh, this one is actually a mining bee, but there's also the um, uh, parchment bees are in the same family. Uh, or plaster bees, rather. Um, but these uh, digger bees, uh, they're another type of solitary bee, but rather than uh, doing the tunneling, um, they actually build their nest in the ground. They don't use the pollinator hotels uh, as much, uh, but they just build their nest in the ground itself. They're also really good pollinators, um, but they are another solitary bee, but it, they kind of look like they're a colony uh, because they like building their nests together. So each individual queen um, will build her nest, uh, but then uh, other queens will come and build their nests right next to each other. So it looks like there's a, a whole colony of uh, uh, bees, uh, maybe underneath your steps or using a, a patch of bare dirt in the back garden. Um, they often get mistaken for yellow jackets or uh, something like that and uh, uh, sprayed with insecticides, uh, thinking that they're dangerous, uh, but they're probably even more docile than even the uh, uh, leafcutter bees or the um, uh, 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 <laughs> they're, they're, they're incredibly, incredibly docile anyways. Uh, they do have a stinger. Um, it's probably possible to get them to sting. I've never managed to get one to, to sting me. I've walked right through their colonies and stepped on the ground, uh, basically where they're coming in and out, and uh, they've not uh, stung me at all. Um, it does look kind of scary, a uh, bunch of these bees coming in and out, uh, flying uh, from underneath the steps. Uh, your mailman may decide to, he doesn't want to uh, deliver mail to your house anymore if it's, uh, they're swarming all around the, the mailbox. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're largely harmless and actually really, really good pollinators as well. Um, but they're another one that's uh, around and a really good pollinator and um, need to be protected from uh, uh, overuse of pesticides. Uh, there's also yellow jackets. This is one I've been trying to get people uh, to realize that yellow jackets, despite um, their kind of jerky behavior, sometimes when our territories overlap, they're actually really quite beneficial. Um, so uh, where the bees are getting most of their protein from pollen, uh, yellow jackets get most of their protein from flies and caterpillars and other things that we consider pests. Uh, but most of their food comes from nectar. Um, so they're visiting flowers, they're collecting uh, nectar, and in doing so, they're also pollinating. And uh, unlike the bees, they're not keeping any of the pollen for themselves. So they're actually quite efficient pollinators as well. And there's a lot of yellow jackets around, uh, especially towards the end of summer. Uh, and they're actually fairly efficient pollinators, uh, um, uh, just with the, the numbers of yellow jackets that we get. Um, so they are actually really beneficial as pollinators, they're really beneficial as predators. Uh, it's only their aggressive nature and when our territories overlap uh, that it becomes an issue. Um, so if the yellow jacket nest is in somewhere where we can uh, tolerate their presence, uh, they're really good to have around. It's only uh, when they're, they're in a place that uh, is not uh, conducive to our safety that uh, they become an issue. But overall, yellow jackets, definitely a good thing. Uh, but there's a number of different ways to encourage a pollinator. Um, so uh, nectar producing plants is, of course, really important. Different pollinators require different types of nectar. So the more variety of different plants you have out is uh, better. One of the things that's uh, been implicated in the decline of a lot of pollinators is our planting of monoculture, especially in agriculture. Just huge, huge fields of nothing but almonds or nothing but uh, canola, uh, things like that. Uh, and much like us, uh, these pollinators don't do that well on a monoculture diet where they're just getting nothing but one type of pollen all the time. Um, 
providing plants that produce nectar throughout the whole season is also really important. Um, so uh, these insects need nectar uh, all year long. So if you have a crop that only produces nectar for about a week uh, in June, um, that doesn't really help them out for the, the rest of the season. So if you can set up your garden so that there's always something in flower uh, at some point in the season, um, that'll help out these uh, insects uh, an awful lot. Um, native pollinators, of course, prefer native plants. So if you can plant native species, uh, that Edmonton Area Land Trust uh, website that I showed has a really good set of resources that shows you a bunch of different native plants that you can plant instead of European species uh, to help uh, promote native species, uh, both in the plants and in the pollinators. Uh, provide some shelter for overwintering. Uh, those bee hotels and the pollinator blocks uh, help out not just uh, the tunnel nesting species, uh, but they can also provide overwintering habitat for a lot of other things like those uh, parasitic wasps, uh, ground beetles, uh, spiders, all sorts of other things can all use that shelter uh, to overwinter. Um, if you leave some uh, leaf litter and uh, uh, low vegetation on the ground, uh, that can also uh, increase their success in overwintering. And probably the most important, don't use persistent broad spectrum pesticides. Um, so insecticides, of course, are uh, uh, not going to be helpful to all these insects, uh, but even fungicides and herbicides that are wiping out uh, some of the, the other plants and even fungus that uh, these insects are depending on um, are going to uh, harm them in the, uh, the long run as well. And so there's my email address. If anybody has uh, additional questions, please feel free to, to contact me. And I believe we're going to have some breakout rooms uh, at the end of the, the uh, um, uh, session uh, if anybody has further questions there. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I'm yeah, just going to interject. If you wanted to ask Mike some questions, um, when Susan sends everyone off to the breakout room, uh, don't go to the breakout room. Just tell your computer you'd like to stick around in the main room and you can ask um, questions there. Yes, and we'll use the chat feature for those questions, and then Michael can respond to as many as possible. And I know there will probably be a lot of people wanting to linger for just finding out more about the pollinators in their own backyards. First, though, we'll have closing words. And then we'll sing Carry the Flame, and there'll be a little bit of an announcement about what's coming up next week. Our closing words are by Sarah Moores Campbell. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us them up for the let us pick them up for the precious gifts that they are, and renewed by their grace, move boldly into the unknown. And now our chalice will extinguish. Do we have a chalice slide? There we are. Our chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the hearts and minds of each one of us. Carry it with you and share it with those you know, those you love, and those you have yet to meet. And we'll sing Carry the Flame, and since we're at a distance from one another. Rather than holding hands, you can hold your hand over your heart or give yourself a self-hug or cross arms and reach out to somebody virtually near you. And now we'll hear Carry the Flame and we'll all sing along.
next week, we will have a session led by Karen Mills and Gordon Ritchie based on Jewish heritage.